Welcome to the Conscious Creative from MuseWorks Audio. The Conscious Creative is a podcast featuring interviews with artists who are doing transformational work in their craft and in their communities. Join us as we discuss different artistic philosophies, give you brand new tools to bring back to your creative spaces, and build a community of artists dedicated to deepening their relationship with their craft. I'm your host, Mike Irish. Thank you for joining us. Welcome to another episode of The Conscious Creative. Today, we have Natasha Zurek, who is a full-time artist living in British Columbia, Canada. She was a professional snowboarder, traveled all over the world as a professional snowboarder, and now is a visionary artist. And today we spoke about her early childhood in Poland, um, her snowboarding career, her life-shifting moment at Burning Man where she turned into an artist, became an artist, how her history as an, as an athlete informs her creativity and her work ethic and stuff like that, as well as reframing her anxiety and how she uses her introverted nature to her benefit. As always, um, this was a great conversation and I really enjoyed getting to know Natasha and hearing about her inspirations and what drives her. She is a really interesting person with really interesting ideas and um, I think you'll really enjoy this episode and find some inspiration from it as well. Before we get into the show, I just want to drop a line about a project that I've been working on through my studio. It's a PDF workbook series called Music Marketing for the DIY Musician. It's based on Bobby Borg's book after the same name, and I'm really stoked about it. We have 20 people so far signed up, and I've gotten some really good feedback. Out of all the things that I've tried to do for my studio and to help artists, this is this has had the most positive feedback, so I'm really excited to share it with people. If you're an indie artist who wants to know more about how to market and promote yourself and sort of come up with a game plan for how you want to approach your career i really i really suggest that you join in there will be a link in the show notes or you can shoot me a dm at museworks audio on instagram Um, other than that i have no no further uh no further announcements but uh but please tune in and enjoy the show with natasha zurek Welcome, Natasha Zurek, to The Conscious Creative. I really appreciate you taking the time. And, um, you know, we spoke probably about a month, month and a half ago now when we first connected. So I'm just really looking forward to, to chatting. And I know a little bit about your story. But, yeah, I'm just really excited to have you on the show. Great. Thanks a lot for inviting me. And I feel really excited to speak with you on your show and to just have a go at sharing my ideas with you and ideas about creativity. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you have a very cool story. So uh, we'll definitely get to, to um, the, the big moment that you had at Burning Man, obviously. But um, I'd love if you could give the audience just a little bit of background, um, you know, about who you are and you, you, hadn't you were a pro snowboarder for a for a while and you went to the olympics you also moved to canada from poland at a pretty young age so um yeah if there's anything that you want to share with the audience that could give them a little bit of an idea of who you are and where you came from i think that would be really great okay sure so yeah i was born in poland in a mountain town uh and in the super early 80s the government was still communist and my dad was a mountain expedition guy on the Polish expedition team. 
Uh, they went around different uh, countries to summit peaks for like national glory. And uh, one time uh, him and a bunch of buddies decided that they were going to summit Mount McKinley, but secretly they were just gonna leave Poland, go to Canada on the way to Mount McKinley and just not come back. So he, I guess, defected from Poland and took about three years for all the paperwork to go through and permissions with visas to be able to, for me and my sister and my mom to join my dad in Canada. So that was the beginning. I immigrated to Canada around six years old. And uh, uh, since I was born in a mountain town, I was skiing since I was two years old. And I was uh, skiing a lot with my dad on the weekends. And then at around 12, 13 years old, I saw snowboarding for the first time. And I thought it was so cool. So I decided to feel like I wanted to pursue snowboarding and do my own thing because skiing was my dad's sport. I started snowboarding as a teenager and right away, even before I started, I was literally obsessed with it. And like, all I could do was think and dream about it. So I uh, was like pushing myself to get really good at it because I was watching all the videos and saw the guys doing all the tricks. And I really wanted to be able to do that too. It was so fun and freeing and, and pretty quickly being a girl at that time, like mid nineties, you got a lot of recognition, even if you could like do basic tricks, because there was a lot of females in the sport at the time. So I got approached by sponsors pretty quickly and given the opportunity to travel Uh, receive product like boards, um, receive money for winning competitions and that kind of thing. Yep. So that was a a real like trajectory to get really good at it and uh, pursue my dreams. So at the time, that was like really what I was focusing on. And uh, maybe I'll just add, so I had the career for about 18 years in total. And even got to ride for Burton, which was like the pinnacle of snowboard companies. And that was a good move because they had a big budget. So it it was literally like nine months of the year traveling, chasing snow, even going down south when it was summer up in the northern hemisphere. Uh, Competing a lot. And then after a bunch of years competing and succeeding, I felt like I wanted a change in my, my identity within snowboarding. So I started doing more video parts and uh, photo shoots for the company. And that was really cool because that was a bit more like creativity coming in where you chose your spot, chose what you wanted to, how you want to build your jump, chose what you want to do, whether you want to hit a rail in the city or go back country. And it's just more like personal expression. And then <clears throat> there was a lot of opportunity to, f- to film even uh, in girls' movies at the time. And that was really good for me because I was really shy around a bunch of guys so it just felt more like I could just relax and focus on snowboarding um yeah so I'll just end it now because I think <laughs> it a lot no that's uh, I mean I I'm so glad that you did because I just I mean I learned so much about you in I I had read that you that you moved um, to Canada from Poland, but I didn't realize that um, that your father defected, which is very intense. I would assume, um, and yeah, that that's just it. Just adds an extra level of intensity to your story that I didn't realize. And, and I mean, then the snowboarding, it just sounds like it must have been so much fun. I, I, I can't imagine it being anything other than just like so much fun going around the world and riding. And um, I assume getting to ride some of the, some of the best places in the world as well, right? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. yeah and then having the opportunity to go into the Olympics uh, two times, uh, one in Japan, the other one in Salt Lake City for half pipe. And uh, then there was a kind of a, at the time I was having like internal struggle issues because I didn't really think 
snowboarding should have been in the Olympics, but at the same, same time, the Olympics is such a huge deal. And like for my parents, they were so proud that it felt like, oh, I don't want to say no, because it's just an experience. It's a life experience and it's super huge. And getting to like walk around in the big arena at the opening ceremony is just so cool. And, but yeah, I felt like snowboarding was more raw and I saw the Olympics being like more governed by committees and uh, sport governing bodies, which were really regulated and had a lot of rules and restrictions. And yeah. I always went into snowboarding more because it was freeing and it felt, it, and it follows more like the skateboarding trajectory where it's more like rebellious. Uh, yeah. So that's just a little bit of inside of like how I felt about that particular circumstance so for me personally, I felt more proud of winning the U.S. Open in snowboarding because that was like a more grassroots snowboarder led snowboard company driven event. Yeah. Yeah. You. So you 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 had internal struggle while while you were in the Olympics. But looking back, do you um, do you feel any differently or do you still do you still feel that way about snowboarding being in the Olympics? Uh, well, I don't worry too much about it. It, yeah. it is what it is, but yeah. I don't regret my like feelings about it or okay. my decisions. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. Interesting. I mean, I, I, I snowboarded a little bit. I skateboarded a lot when I was, when I was a kid. So I do understand that like um, sort of punk rock mentality that that snowboarding and skateboarding have and that like not wanting to be involved in in the um in the more corporate side of things or the more controlled side of things or the cleaner side of things however you want to say mm -hmm. so after you had you had an injury right and then there was there was a pretty bad crash but you didn't get injured in it as well right uh, I'll just kind of uh, describe it then, I guess, towards the end of my career, uh, coming into like 2009, 10, I was uh, in New Zealand and I was filming uh, for my sponsor, a video, uh, heli boarding. And so the guys are up in the helicopter with the doors off and kind of hanging off, belted inside the helicopter, videoing and photoing. So it's like high pressure scenario. And because it's like time is money kind of thing. Um, but in uh, like the quickness of everything, I ended up dropping into this pure open bowl with no tracks. And as I dropped in, the whole thing fractured around me and like giant like blocks of snow, the whole thing just turned into like a pixelated giant blocks of snow. And then the weight of it just totally sucked me in and down the whole mountain all the way through like a boulder field off a cliff. Then when I landed, um, for some reason, I was okay didn't get smacked into a rock, but the whole way down, I'm like bracing myself and I'm thinking, oh my God, I'm going to die. But it wasn't actually like an, oh my God, it was more like, oh, okay, I'm going to die now. Like I made all the decisions and this is my choices that I made to put myself in this situation now. So I have no one to blame but myself. So it was like a time stood still kind of moment and full acceptance of the moment and of what was about to happen. But anyways, towards the bottom, the slope, uh, started fanning all the snow out so all of it the weight of it on over my head started to the level just go down 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 until towards the very end I could like literally just ride out of it so I was like really not injured but my board was broken in half so like, all the the impact went into the snowboard but that really shook me and I was like okay I don't even <clears throat> after all like my full career don't even love snowboarding that much anymore to die for it or to even get injured. So what's the point of being <clears throat> and just um, doing the same old, same old, if I'm not really fully in it. So at that point, I just decided that I'm going to retire. And I just like quit snowboarding cold Turkey, pretty much uh, like a few months after that, after like things began to settle. Yeah. <clears throat> so that was like the end of that. Did you finish um, filming your part? Uh, yeah, yeah, because that yeah. was like a New Zealand season. And so that's always like the tail end of the season. Right. Generally. Yeah. 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 
Oh, wow. Wow. That's so scary. I, I worked, um, I worked up by Smithers in a heli skiing lodge for, for a season. And there was, there was a couple close calls. I, I was, I was in the kitchen, but yeah, I've been in that environment and, um, it's, it's, a, it's a lot more dangerous than, um, than I knew that's for sure. Um, before I went up there, it's that back, back country boarding is really intense. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. And on top of that, like the, when you're on a professional level, you're always taking it to the limit. You're always trying to like push your limit and be super sensitive to where your limit is and never like push too far, but you don't want to slack off either because then you're not going to progress and kind of your, the name in the game is to progress yourself and the sport. So how was it in that transitionary period um, when you quit snowboarding? Did, did you feel lost or were you struggling at all? Yeah. Um, so for me, it literally went that uh, I, I think I was like felt a sense of already moving forward before I quit. So I didn't feel lost. I was already felt like I was being attracted to something. Some future event was pulling me towards it. And I still feel that way now. So I went to Burning Man that uh, at the end um, of the summer, early fall, which is usually when Burning Man occurs in Nevada, in the desert. It's like a giant festival, uh, biggest uh, like alternative music art festival in the world. And um, I'll just jump right into it. I uh, ended up taking a half a hit of acid and was walking around the desert looking at all the art installations. And I ended up in one of the uh, galleries called Fractal Nation. And for some reason, having the effect of the acid, I was able to look at the art and see it in a new way <clears throat> that I was looking at it. And I noticed that there was so much information coming from every work of art that every square inch of art had like a thousand bits of information in it. And just like how when we hone our skill of listening or, um, or seeing uh, the uh, effects of the acid were able to let me hone other um, senses that we have in our world, in our bodies that we're not completely aware of or used to uh, utilizing. So just having a bit more sensitivity in that way, I was able to see that the art actually is projecting a lot of energy information and that it is actually affects me, just how nature affects me and how walking through a forest affects me and can affect my uh, vibrational state or my emotional, physical state. The art uh, actually has the same power. And so I realized that if you're an artist with a pure and strong intention, you can imbue that into your artwork. And the more crystalline and strong your intention is, the more you can put it into the art and the more resonance it can have out into the world on people, even if they're not aware that it's affecting them. Uh, so that's kind of was like a general purpose of art was to how can I, as, as I develop my consciousness, use art in a conscious way to be able to uh, share my message, share um, my feelings and my vision, and uh, in a way that will contribute to the general well being of humanity and the general awakening and self realization, as well as realization of the collective and of our power. <clears throat> uh, the power that I have as an individual and the power that we have together as a group of people mm -hmm. and hopefully a more awakened group of people. Yeah. yeah. Wow. wow. I love what you just said about <laughs> the, as the more pure your intention, um, the more impact you can have 
on on your art or with your art. Um, yeah. I'd like to say a, a bit more to that. Yeah. As, as an athlete, when you train in snowboarding yeah. for higher performance potential, <clears throat> actually apply that same mentality as an artist. I feel I can be a, a well-trained artist, mm -hmm. not just in training my hand and my eye to see, but also training in like self-knowledge uh, with meditation, with focus, with proper eating, lots of rest, uh, all the things that can like contribute to my physiology being primed and optimum so that I can essentially perform as I, uh, as I create the piece of artwork and all the energy that and attention that's required to make it as crystal clear as possible. So that's my vision as an artist for myself. So I really hope that my art can come across as crystal clear and that the message and the vision is sharp and, and not fuzzy because I feel like as an artist, I'm trying to be as much in the present moment in order to have access to a kind of a awareness of the future, but not like a, a future event, like uh, this lottery ticket is gonna be the winning number, not that kind of, but more of a sense of what is the object that transcendental object, which is a McKenna term, Terence McKenna term, in, in, the, in our collective future, what is it pulling us towards? And the more clear we can be, the more we can receive uh, information and kind of channel it through our speaking and through our art making or through other contributions, like for yourself, like in podcast making yeah. or working with music. Yeah. yeah. Oh. So what, what things do you do um, that you find help you um, achieve that sort of focus and that, that state that you feel like you need to be in to create as best as possible and as purely as possible? Yeah, there's so much that goes into it. Like I already mm -hmm. mentioned a few things like proper eating, rest, yeah, uh, I do breathing. So I like to do the Wim Hof breathing as well, because yeah. it helps me to like clear myself and go deeper into my physiology. And I feel it's a great way for me to go deep more into my subconscious and kind of deal with all that part of my unconscious and, and subconscious that actually affects how I think and how I behave as a way to process it and kind of start to make it more come up into the consciousness so it can be looked at. But besides that, like a super huge thing that I think is super important that I'm really struggling with is my attention and things of where in the day does my attention go. And so I think it's such a blessing that we're also interconnected on the internet and it enables us to be creators, like content creators and share that content. But at the same time, everyone else or so many other people, including corporations, companies or content creators and every thing and everybody's vying for our attention. So in order to get crystal clear on my message and my vision, I feel like I almost have to tune out what, especially like what, like the companies who have big budgets and like know about human psychology and know how to manipulate us in ways that we're not even aware of that, um, all that stuff is like a lot of noise. And so it's a real struggle to balance feeling like, yeah, I want to be connected with the outside world and not be a hermit and not know what's going on. But at the same time, that stuff, so much of it is so much noise that it uh, drowns out the inner message, which is so subtle. And you have to have a lot of patience. And I feel training to tune that antenna to be able to receive these subtle messages because I swear they're like coming out of another dimension and we're so well trained in seeing and hearing in these uh, in our 3D terrestrial world, but there's so much more going on. And it serves us, I think, to be more in tune with not just the obvious stuff. Yeah. Oh, preach, preach. <laughs> yeah, you're speaking so well, Natasha. Um, I find just for for people listening um 
I, I struggle with the same thing. Um, and, you know, I'm pretty active on social media for my business. Um, you know, I'm, I try like on Instagram, I try to be posting pretty much every day and with quality stuff that is useful for people. But I find as I do that, that I end up getting sucked in as well, unfortunately. And um, I know that there's, like you said, there's, there's good things and then there's all the noise as well. And uh, I don't think it's, I don't think it's smart or healthy to put up walls entirely and block everything out. But something that helps me personally is I have a couple apps on my phone and on my computer that um, I can set up schedules and they block websites and block um, apps on my phone so that say after three o'clock every day, I can't go on Instagram on my phone. So it doesn't entirely block it out for me, but it does put up like a bit of a barrier. So just for people listening, I think that that is a way that you can help kind of in a measured way return to yourself a little bit. Yeah. Reclaim your time. It sounds like yeah. a good idea. Like very. Yeah. yeah. I would really recommend it. Really recommend it. I, Cause I mean, I think we all know what it's like to finish up a day of work and then, um, you know, you look down at your phone and then all of a sudden it's time to go to bed and you don't even know where the time went. And it's this incredibly frustrating sensation <laughs> where you just realize that you just wasted an evening when you could have been sitting, reading a nice book or going for a walk or something like that. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I would really recommend it to anybody listening. Yeah, that feeling is like kind of soul sucking. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. It's soul sucking is a great, a great word for it. Yeah. But I just want to say and add to, to that, like, I'm just thinking as you're speaking that obviously as an artist and, and you with music, you want to be able to relate your art to what's actually happening on the planet. It's like, you don't want to just be like, a space cadet and like tune everything out and be like, oh, I'm one with God. Like my art is like vibration of the heavenly universe because how's that really going to help people? Like, so it, it's so important to I, be in touch with the higher aspects, but to connect them with all the earthly, ugly, difficult, uh, confrontational things. And how can we like recombinate them to, uh, I guess, uh, so we can feel empowered yet still be able to effectively deal with them. Oh, and I guess take, take all the difficulties and process them through our inner being and then bring them out back into the world as, as our mode of communication and as our mode of sharing and ability to connect with other people. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I was, um, I've, I've been, I haven't been writing very much for my own music because I've been working on my, on, in the studio for other people's music for the most part, but I've been writing and it's been a little bit too much um, up there and not enough um, grounded in reality. And just something that kind of came to, to mind when you were talking about that is, it's good to be connected to the two, I think, because you can take the stuff that's lower and through the creative process, you can transform it and heal it and bring it up to a higher level, I think. Um, that's just sort of a thought that came to me. So I don't want to stand by it too much, but it's just something that sort of struck me when you were talking. Um, so, yeah, I just want to add to that again. Yeah. Like it comes to mind too to say that kind of the purpose of it all is to to bring everyone else on board. Like so that I'm not just doing it by myself, but that we're we're kind of like connecting and doing it together. But we each are have our own indi individual talent and skill set to contribute to the to the whole. But uh 
like it, it's really like I can't describe it fully well yet, but like the mission and the vision is how can we more all of us more like can invite each other to awaken and come online so we can be better suited and positioned to collaborate together. And and I really do personally have an uh, like an allergy to like real corporate media messaging stuff. I think it's that really serves a very small elite group of people and people are making money in those um, small subsets of individuals, but maybe to the disempowerment of many other people, because a lot of that messaging isn't um, pro health and pro the best for the individual. It's more kind of like be in line and conform to a certain way of thinking and being. But I'm hoping that as artists, we can like connect and reinvent and re revivify our culture so that it can like serve our well-being, our individual and our family and our community well-being. So this is all in development, but it's like wonderful to talk about because like now I see it as that I'm an artist, but I don't do art just for me. And I don't do art alone, even though I sit in the room for like hundreds of hours and paint alone. Nothing I paint or talk about is my mind. It's it's like everything came to me from someone else, and it's just re uh, reimagined through my pers perspective. Um, yeah. So I hope like to speak that way can get people excited, and more being like, yeah, you know, I want to be a part of that. Like that's the party that I want to be a part of, and. Uh, so it's like an inviting, like a celebratory spirit that people, you know, even though life is hard and there's so many day-to-day -day challenges, I think like we can help to lift each other up. Hopefully mm -hmm. yeah. that's my goal. That's my vision. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think that, um, you know, if, if your end goal of anything that you do whether it be creatively or in business or in politics. I mean, if your end goal isn't to be empowering other people, I really don't understand what the purpose of it is at the end of the day, you know? So I think when we're creating, um, we should have, we should keep that in mind. And I think that's sort of in line with what you're saying as well. Right. Yeah. 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 Wow. This has been an incredible interview. So, <laughs> Natasha. I'm glad. I'm, and um, it was making sense, I hope. <laughs> yeah. No, no, you're making absolute sense. Yeah. Um, now, I'd like to dive into something that um, we spoke about a little bit before. Um, we, we had a bit of a chat about a month ago before, before we booked the interview. And, um, and then I read another interview that sometimes that you struggled with shyness, um, at an early age, and you also struggled with anxiety as well. And, um, I wonder how, how do you think that's impacted your, you as an artist? Uh, well, I think it definitely makes me a person that's comfortable in being alone and comfortable with silence. And so when I'm sitting alone in silence a lot, then uh, my sensors, my biological sensors are gonna pick up something. Uh, and so I think it honed my ability to maybe listen more to my higher self. Uh, but also it just gives me an opportunity to kind of in, absorb what I, um, what I observe and, mm -hmm. and like really have time to sit with it and process it. Yeah. Yeah. So then overcoming shyness and kind of introversion is just the thing I, it's like a, what my obstacle, but I have to overcome it. And just like, I know I can send my body off a 30 foot cliff and do the thing that I shit my pants scared of that I, I'm not going to die overcoming um, you know, shyness. So, so I'm used to overcoming challenges in order to grow. And I perceive like the end goal and there's a benefit to doing it. So uh, I am glad that I 
I'm starting to communicate because I think also as an artist, it's really helpful not just to show the vision, but to, to be able to speak about the vision. Because when you can speak about it with another person, you can really connect with them. And then you can make it personal to that person. And then you can hear their story and their vision because it invites the opportunity for that person to share. So then it's more of like a back and forth rewarding thing. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So would you say that, do you think that because, um, that because you're so sensitive that that cause, that that, can be a cause of um, of the anxiety, but also because you're so sensitive that when you're sitting alone, that you can pick up on on the subtler um, subtler energies, I guess. Uh, yeah, like being sensitive, I guess, feels like anything that's distressing can be more of an overwhelm. Yeah. So then there's the tendency to want to just go back into the comfort zone yeah. and avoid all the things that are causing the overload or the distress. Yeah. 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 I'm very familiar with that. Yeah, mm -hmm. definitely. Unfortunately, I end up sometimes creating because when you, when I found when I get protective like that, then the space, my, comfort zone just gets smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller until it doesn't exist anywhere. So I've definitely found for myself that the more I can push out of my comfort zone, the more comfortable I can feel within my comfort zone. I don't know if you can relate to that at all. Oh, totally. Yeah. That's just like training, like pushing the bar. Yeah. yeah. But yeah. that also makes me want to address again, the vision of the art and artists generally in creating our culture that can make weird people feel just at home yeah. in our culture, like that's more ex accepting and uh, that people are less pushing away weird things because it makes them feel uncomfortable or triggers their uh, unknown sense of weirdness. Uh, yeah. So because it would be so much nicer if we were growing up and we didn't have to feel like we have to create a protective shell around a culture and situ circumstances that kind of like chip away at us or make, make us feel like we're not safe. Because imagine if we felt safe right off the bat, we could just be that much more connected and that much more productive and creative and generate so much more like wonderful experiences and creations. Yeah, I'm pretty optimistic that we can get there. Yeah. 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 I you know, there is there's a lot of um, you know, I don't need to say it, but there's a lot of darkness in the world, obviously. But there's some incredible work being done um on the positive side of things as well. I think like Gabor Mate and Brene Brown um are just two examples of people who are really investigating um know trauma and how we protect ourselves and how we can live more um openly and um authentically and honestly and um and i think that's it's such a beautiful thing and i i've, I've been noticing that you know it's funny you know you can say that someone you say someone's weird or you can say like maybe for me a quicker a more normal reaction would be like oh that person's annoying and i was i was at a social event a couple days ago um and uh and someone made me feel uncomfortable but i realized it's not them that's being annoying it's just something that they're that something that they're doing i'm reacting to it in a way that annoys me and <laughs> it's my problem at the end of the day you know so i mean if you feel like someone's weird or someone's authenticity 
um, makes you feel uncomfortable, I think it's really important that people remember that um, that's a you problem. That's not a them problem. Does that make sense? Oh, yeah, definitely. Like, it sounds like you've been reading upon your um, personal psychology uh, <laughs> information and connecting. Yeah, yeah, I have actually. I've been reading a book called I've been reading The Laws of Human Nature by Robert Greene. I don't know if you've ever heard of it. But, I've heard um, of it, yeah. Yeah, it's uh, making me do a lot of self-reflection, which is really interesting. Yeah, and that's great. Like you're getting a guided self-reflection through that certain lens. So that's yeah. helpful. It's super beneficial. Yeah, yeah. The structure of it. Because it's hard to like kind of fumble your way through the dark just absolutely. with a plan or a guide. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Oh, wow. Um, yeah, is there anything else you want to talk about? Um, well, I, I did want to touch on kind of something I've been thinking about lately. Yeah. The idea of our digital identity. Okay. And I think that... Um, we need to become more aware of what is our digital identity and the scope and the reach it has. And uh, essentially, I think in the way that like social media, for example, is structured right now, I think uh, essentially the companies abuse our social identity for their own profit and gain. And you have millions of people creating and putting content uh, but not really getting value back for the content that they create on these social media platforms while the platforms themselves are making billions of dollars. Mm -hmm. And I think that, that, that there's, there's, I'm just starting to think about this, but it feels a bit like an abusive relationship mm -hmm. because they're getting all the value at your. Yeah. Have you, is there, did you come up with this idea yourself or is there some sort of um, resources that, or books or, um, or something like that, that sort of triggered your thinking like well, this? For now, it's literally, it's just me hearing things here and there and just kind of amalgamating it yeah. in myself and then being trying to like hump, mull over these things. So yeah, um, I like, I know there are people in crypto spaces that are already thinking, okay, yeah, let's um, make it so that we can earn money for our identity. So I, yeah. there's definitely things like that already being talked about. I'm just connecting it to where it's like connecting the value in our self-worth and how probably us engaging more in um, self-development will give us more empowered and inner resources to really take a stand online. Yeah. And, and I am a bit adversarial with in my feeling with these like big, billion dollar companies i don't think it's yeah I, so we talk about darkness and that's part of it and and so i'm not going to talk too much about darkness but i do think that that shouldn't be not talked about that that needs to also be brought up to the surface so that we can collectively look at it and and properly deal with it and so then the idea of like coming together collectively is also super important to me because like, think of all this information that we can get online. Not one person can download it all, right? Unless you're like a, like a galaxy brain type person where you can like literally like comprehend and then like uh, share back all the information that you come across. But most of us living regular lives with families, there's only so much time we have to gain the information, but there's so much of it out there. So then I'm thinking, well, if you know this set of things and I know these set of things and then someone over there knows something else, if we come together and like make sense collectively of everything, that we're all better off for it. And somehow I think there's like a potential and like an evolutionary leap in the consciousness of humanity we, when we can really start to gain awareness and like properly utilize our collective consciousness capability capacity but for that that requires communication and it requires that different groups of people actually talk to each other 
yeah. not what's happening online with so much on social media where the opposite is happening. I think that can be quite yeah. dangerous. Yeah. Oh, wow. Wow. <laughs> I mean, in the background, sorry. <laughs> no, no, it's fine. I, I should, I should be able to, uh, to, to clean it up. Um, so um, I just have, you kind of already answered this a little bit um, earlier in the interview, but I have one, one last question I'd like to ask you um, is what impact you want to leave in the world with your creativity? Mm, uh, feels like I want to, yeah, I, I, I like literally would want to help and uh, like connect with all the people that can bring more awakening and more like self-awareness and other awareness and world awareness, just more consciousness. I want to create art that helps us to create, connect more neurons in our own brains and collective neurons in the, the group brain. Yeah. yeah. So I want to create art that speaks to that and help be make that become more of a reality. Yeah. So literally like, reach out into the future and like bring it down to now to the 3d now and start creating it like more consciously yeah. love it yeah love it yeah so thanks for this conversation thank you um just before we head out is there anywhere uh like your website or um i don't want to say it now but maybe social media <laughs> or yeah, <it's> like <laughs> somewhere that uh people can reach you, find your work and, and connect with you? Yeah, so on Instagram, my name is natka01, so N-A-T-K-A-0-1. Okay. And my website address is natasha, N-A-T-A-S-Z-A, Zurek, Z-U-R-E-K, art.com. Okay, perfect. Thanks so much, Natasha. Thank you for your answers and... Um, this was a really, really incredible interview. So thank you. I'm glad. I'm really, I had a really wonderful time talking to you. Thank you. So once again, I want to thank Natasha for her time. We'll have links to her social media and her website in the show notes. If you're interested in checking out her art or making a purchase, she makes really, really beautiful art. Um, so yeah. I, I really recommend you check it out at the very least. She brought up a couple points that I thought were really interesting and one that's been brought up recently in the Haley Harkin interview about psychedelics and how it can introduce a new frequency of listening and, um, and as Natasha was saying she was understanding how much information there is in art which is a really interesting concept and put um, very succinctly in a way that I can really understand it um, and I found it interesting that that this was brought up twice in such quick succession and as well she spoke about treating her art as an athlete would treat their craft and We've spoken a bit about this before on the show about pra the way that athletes practice and bringing that kind of practice into your your art, but I don't think we've spoken about diet or focus or meditation. I think getting the right sleep, eating healthy food, quality food for what your body needs, um, meditation and attention are really important in balance with uh, being receptive and being allowing. It's, it's a fine balance being an artist, I think, but I think that there's great value in treating your body right and um, practicing and focusing and practicing focus. I think that far too often artists are thought of as uh, you know, you're better off if you're on drugs or you're better off if you're strung out or an addict, but I don't think that that's the case. I think a lot of really great music comes from um, hard work. 
Now, the last thing that I wanted to talk about was her necessity um, of being comfortable being alone to be an artist. And uh, Stephen Pressfield has spoken about this in his books. And I know I'm very comfortable being alone. It's just um, part of who I am. I'm very comfortable sitting in the studio all day. Um, and I think you have to be to to be effectively creative, um, unless you're collaborating, of course. So those are the three points that I kind of took away. I think that um, I think there's a lot to learn from this interview. Even beyond that, there's some really interesting um, and inspiring topics to be uh, to be listened or to be thought about. So. Beyond that, I want to say thank you for tuning in. Um, give me a follow at MuseWorks Audio if you are enjoying the content that I'm putting out. And as I said at the beginning of the episode, if you are interested in signing up for these free this free PDF series, if you're an artist who is looking to learn how to promote yourself and how to market yourself, I really suggest you sign up for the PDF series. Just shoot me a DM on Instagram at MuseWorks Audio, or you can sign up on my website, and there will be a link below for that as well. So thank you very much, and uh, chat to you again in two weeks. Cheers.